welcome to the Human Broadcheck Podcast. Here we have inspiring stories worth spreading. I am your host, Karina Rosa Feikenberg. What? We are already on. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, hello. A warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. We are here lying, more or less, <laughs> on a beautiful piece of grass. Who are you, Charlie? Um, I'm uh, Charlie Cruz. My middle name is... F it's a beautiful name, by the way. Yeah, well, CC. CC. It's CFC, actually. It's yeah. Charles Frederick. <laughs> of course, there had to be a Frederick. It's uh, like, uh, actually, my dad uh, was very impressed when he met my mom about her heritage. And this is kind of a funny note to open our podcast today. But uh, when my father married my mother and my mother was expecting me, um, he wanted to name me Federico like him. And uh, my mother said, my child is not going to have his father's name. He's going to have his own name, <laughs> you know. And so my dad said, okay, and which name should we give him then? But and she, my mom said, I mean, it's fine if he has your name, but he can, he can be the middle name, you know, or the second name. And um, <laughs> she said, I think his, his name should be Carl, Carl or Carlos, you know. And my dad said, oh, I love that, you know. It's uh, like... Kings of Prussia, you know, Carl Frederick. Yes, yes, my mother said, that's a great idea. Yeah, we'll, we'll call him Carl Frederick. Sounds lovely. Okay, fine. So I'm born and um, they named me Charles, you know, Carlos Federico. And um, several months pass by. And uh, <laughs> finally, I'm like six or eight months and my mom and my dad take me so that my mom's side of the family meets me in New York. <laughs> Only to find out, my poor father, that uh, every first male of every generation in my mother's side of the family is named Carl. <laughs> <laughs> This is not true. It's a true story. Yes. So, this, this represents very clearly uh, what my parents are like. Uh, my mother is the daughter of, uh, of two immigrant parents. Uh, she was raised in the United States. Uh, and her background is Swedish and German, but Prussian particularly nowadays. Nobody knows what Prussia was. I do. Uh, you do, yes, of course. Uh, that wonderful coincidence we had. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but many people really don't know it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, very pitifully, even in Germany, people... Mm -hmm. When you talk about poison, they, they look at you and they say, what is that? <laughs> uh, anyhow, we'll leave that to the wind. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, coming back to my parents, uh, I'm, I'm the child of two very generous, uh, beautiful souls who have kindly provided for me and my siblings in every possible way they could. What's the background of your dad? My dad's background is Spanish, from the north of Spain, from the center and the north of Spain. So um, uh, I'm just like a, like a stray dog from the streets. One third, one thing, one third, another, and a third of another. You know, nothing special. <laughs> But it provided for very uh, happy times at home, particularly mm -hmm. at the table when my grandparents were alive. Because um, nobody spoke the same language of origin, you know. Uh, one spoke Basque, the other one spoke Spanish, the other one spoke Swedish, and the other one spoke German. So that made the official language at home at the table when my grandparents were there, English. And um, I had the pleasure to chat with you in German. How many languages do you speak, Charlie? <laughs> well, I, aside of gibberish, you mean... Um, I speak five languages, French, Italian, German, Spanish, and English. Sadly, I don't speak any of the Mayan languages of the land of the beautiful Guatemala that I live in, which would open, uh, open a new universe to me. You know, every language you speak 
opens the doors of mm-hmm. of of a world that you didn't know or or you might have known about but not as well as uh, as as one does when mm. we're going to get bitten by these wasps i think oh they're flying around oh massive yeah no. might i ask whether you have mayan friends yes i do i do i do have quite a few um from very diverse different mayan backgrounds um i have one who is the son of a shaman wow um and he calls himself buo which means owl um and he is a mayan healer and as a son of a shaman he's quite a, quite a special character um, did you work with him yes 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 he's often at home because he gives the most uh amazing massages Uh, when you know it's kind of a mix of a deep tissue with a yeah. spiritual mayan um perspective and it's 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 a very good very good massage so he's healing through body work through the yes. real touch yes, right yes yes and he can tell you about um Many you are things. lying now. I need to change my position all as right, well. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Sounds great. So, um mm-hmm. he he tells you very many things about your your body. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if your liver is not feeling right and and the emotions that he might feel from your energy. And he's always hit the hit it on the spot, you know. So it's quite amazing. I think he's got his father's gift. Um and then I have very many others. Uh, both adults and children from a completely different background buo uh, comes from a, a, a village around lake atitlan which is probably one of the most beautiful lakes you'll ever visit in your life um which sits atop of a, a huge ancient volcano and, the, and it's a very very big lake and this lake used to be the crater of the volcano Uh, and it has 12 villages around it each with the name of an apostle mm. named after the 12 apostles. I didn't know the last one. Wow. Yes, yes. And so uh Buo comes from San Pedro la Laguna. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from the Mayans because you have a very diverse background so different influences, yes. right? Your German is like really good. <laughs> you said you you were close to Kids bill when you celebrate um, Christmas from time to time and you receive. Yes. So what did you learn from that particular culture? From the Mayan culture. Well, I don't think I've finished learning from them. They are so their ancestral knowledge is so vast that uh it's it, it will be a life project to really learn mm-hmm. from them. Uh, the respect for land and and humankind um the way that their uh, cos- cosmovision of the world the uh, their ability to follow the moon in mm. regards to their agricultural mm. practices um the way that uh, their society is built and structured the way they praise and punish uh is very different to the one that probably most western civilizations use how do they punish or how did they well, punish it, it it i've never seen one punishing but uh, the social justice system is very particular with them um when you've done something bad sometimes uh, their family members sit around the table with him or or wherever they are and they tell them about all the good things that they that they are made of and this reminds them who they truly are and they kind of visit what evil spirit has gotten into him or her um and the reason why they have behaved different to what they're made of while you're talking to me you're looking up into the sky yes i'm a little what? worried oh no me not <laughs> what okay. are you made of what are you really made of charlie i think i am made of um very many particles that are particularly love and ignorance you know uh which is not a very good combination <laughs> but i do enjoy being me um and uh why did i say ignorance is because 
you know, and this life is beautiful. And every day, like today, sitting here with you, one learns so many new things about it. it it's a never-ending story of revelations. And so that's why I choose to sit on the student chair rather than the teacher. And um, that's why I, I mentioned the ignorance part, because... Every day we wake up, we think we'll learn something new, but we still ignore what tomorrow will bring. You know, so uh, I think that, together with love and intention, um, moves us forward to whatever we choose to be, you know. So I think it's a very ephemeral answer, but, um, <laughs> but I really don't know what I'm made of. I know I'm made of many particles of energy, Uh, that will, you know, intention, energy, love. Um, and yeah, I'm not so sure. The rest, I think, is water. Charlie, you are leading, I think, 12 companies. Well, I, I don't and, lead them myself. Okay, but you are participating yes. and, and giving them the structure and bringing them forward. Yes. And I think um, some couple of hundred employees are also influenced by you. To what extent, how do you carry that responsibility? What is your maxim when you work with them together with the employees? Mm -hmm. How can you give them motivation? How can you give them a proper feedback? How can you lead? What are the key qualities, right. you would say? Well, I would tell you that, first of all, I don't lead them by myself. I sit mm -hmm. on the board with my family, mm -hmm. and we together lead this company. We are... Uh, succeeding now. I mean, my father has decided to sit back and uh, be off the board of directors table. He's now going to be 82. And um, and he's basically leaving, or he's been slowly passing things on to us. Uh, I have two siblings. Uh, so to us sister. means like three. Mm -hmm. Yes, to me and my brother and my sister. And I, we also have the good fortune of having my first cousin, Jose, who works with us. He's our CEO. And basically, uh, to answer your question, how do we lead? We, we try to follow my dad's example. Mm -hmm. um, we lead and we treat our employees as their, our own family. Um, their well-being, their welfare is uh, our priority well beyond uh, our, our clientele. Uh, we are a family who focuses on our employees' well-being first and clientele second. Sometimes people are confused by this concept, but if you don't have happy employees, you well know that your clients are not going to be well treated, you know? And so uh, we lead them by example, um, we do treat them as family members and we sit with them weekly. Weekly? Weekly. Uh, through our, not us personally, we do it personally sometimes monthly. But uh, our, our general, our, our high uh, management, our upper management sits weekly. And we, we basically listen to their feedback. How do we motivate them? We motivate them by rewarding them in the ways that we think that they can take the most advantage of. For instance, um, if they uh, wish to attend college for a new master's degree or a new field of interest, then we will pay for half of it. And once they have their diploma or certificate, their salary will reflect the... Um, improvement that they've made for themselves as professionals but also we motivate them for instance in my in my um, jurisdiction or what i'm in charge of for the family is um, the relation the ratio of the balance between work and family it is very important that each and every one of our employees understands that they exist to live their lives successfully not to be our employees or to be productive, right? And there has to be a balance. So we've set many parameters. Um, I don't know about what benefits may exist in other countries of the world, but we as a family tried, we provide around 18 extra benefits that the law demands that we give 
to our employees and they're basically um, based on uh, personal life, mm. you know? Um, I would say this is an exception here in Guatemala. It is. It is. I'm proud to say it is. And uh, we've learned it by uh, my father's example. My father is a very kind and hardworking man who built his own companies. He was the one who started to build up the companies. Yes. Wow. Yes. And basically, uh, he started them and uh, has been in the business for nearly 60 years. And the business is about what? What well, kind of product made, or services? We, we, what, our core business has always been phytosanitary products which is basically medicines for plants, uh, plant health, and then uh, plant vitamins, which is fertilizers. Of course, that's an industry that has been on the spotlight for a couple of decades now and has transformed significantly. Um, in the very beginning, yes, uh, he dealt with all the products that now are unspeakable, uh, but he ignored the reality of of what was going on, as did the rest of the world. Once he started discovering some of the uh, hazardous parts of these products, we changed our core values at the company, for instance, to never have, for instance, a red band product. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we have ba basically changed our direction. We have not changed the industry. We have changed our focus. Mm -hmm. And we have gone into a cleaner, healthier, responsible um, line of products. Because naturally what we want is to leave uh, a company for our successors, our, our children, or the children of my siblings, that is responsible, that is creating jobs and, and taking care of the world our successors will live in, you know? Where are those values coming from? Because As you said, it's it's not usual to have those concepts where you incorporate the social needs of your employees here in Guatemala. So, where was it coming from to not only go and run after the money? Well, I think running after the money is the easiest thing to do. I don't like to call it natural because it is quite a stupid... Uh, <laughs> uh, answer to be honest uh, frankly I think life needs to be rewarding in a personal level and uh, of course I sit here on this beautiful grass uh, which is uh, idyllic you know it's idyllic and we have birds around the sun is shining birds, we just had a beautiful we... lunch with friends right yes yeah, and all of those are blessings you know they are they are um, things to be very Uh, grateful for and uh, gratefulness is something money cannot buy what are you right now grateful for Charlie right now in that well, very moment uh, actually the fact that this pandemic is over or is more controlled is certainly not over uh, that we have the freedom of coming to this beautiful city of Antigua you know so we have freedom we have health we have life and we just had a yummy meal together and I have my beautiful chocolate lab that I travel everywhere with here with me. He's huge. Again, a very huge dog. Yes, I still get used to them. He's very healthy too, which makes me very happy. How is your relationship to your dog? Uh, it's uh, it's impeccable. It's 24-7 uh, almost. He goes with me everywhere. He comes to work with me. Oh, really? Yes. Everyone at work knows him. He comes uh, on trips, on vacations with me also. Uh, he's a family member and a very... And a very good family member. He's, he's a big eater like his papa. <laughs> But he's I, calm and he's peaceful. He's, he's a kind animal. When it comes to family members, you told me this morning that you're taking care of 12 kids that do come from underprivileged backgrounds. Yes. And I could see some of the WhatsApp chats between the guys and you and I could see how intense the contact is and also how deep it goes. Yes. So... Um, I remember a couple of days ago I asked you, do you have kids? And you said, I wish I had. And at the same time, you have them. Yes. How does it feel now to have those 12 kids to a certain degree, I would even call it adopted? 
like emotionally you know yes. like i could feel when you spoke about them yeah. that you care for them oh, absolutely. that you think about their future that you try to motivate them to get further in their education yes so um i came upon this this wonderful path uh, through a friend uh, who used to live in my house is english and um a person that i admire very much who's basically one of those selfless souls who dedicates his time and his efforts and heart to people who have a lot less than we do and um through the admiration i i had from from chad his name is chad van stalen he's english um through the admiration of the hard work and and heart and soul that he devoted to delivering these people from the scarcity and 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 the sad reality that they must endure i was very inspired to join forces with him and uh and step up to the responsibility uh i think it's our obligation when one is has the good fortune of being born because it's it's sheer luck isn't it mm-hmm. i mean you're born into the family you are born into Uh, nobody really asked me or maybe they did i don't remember <laughs> i was fortunate to be born into good parents who loved me and who took good care of me and the dog Sorry about that <laughs> oh good uh, and um i think that makes me responsible uh it's my duty uh, or it's the way I, i choose to see it as if if i've been lucky and blessed with a good family a job a roof and a meal you know clothes you know uh i feel that i should share that res- that that blessing you know with those less fortunate so many people around the world have so much less than the mean and it really doesn't cost us much to to share a little bit of our good fortune with them and 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 of course each one shares or gives what they can without without falling out of their comfort zone and still that little bit or a big or much that they can give is such makes such an impact for those who have less some people some friends you know tell me oh i really want to help you but i don't have a lot of money and i said well did you know that help doesn't always come in money by you know in in the sh- in the form of money you know you have time you have wealth or you have a wealth of health uh, you have strength you have knowledge you have kindness in your heart or a good desire all of those things help me all of those things help me you can help me in so many ways you know you can drive a car to deliver soap to them that's immense help uh you can uh, help me uh find books for them at the beginning of the year notebooks pens you have a friend who makes pens you have a friend who makes soaps uh whatever you know uh or you can donate cereal if that's what you can afford whatever you can get is very appreciated and i think because of the values that are have been actually getting intensifying in in the world currently you know it's all about this in your face brands and money and who has more and more and more that we have forgotten that um we have sufficient and i'm not sound i'm not trying to sound frugal uh i'm just i'm just pretty sure that whatever little we can give if we think it's little is still a lot for so many others in the world and um getting back on track i decided that i would give whatever i could to chad to help him and to join him give children 12 children that we have uh selected because of their intellectual uh capacities but also because of their attitudes towards life um and these are 12 children indigenous children from the highlands in Guatemala from a region called Alta Verapaz which by the way I strongly recommend you visit its paradise <laughs> It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's really paradise. And these kids have grown up in paradise but without a proper education or or, or nourishment, food. Uh their diet has been 
provide it, but it's scarce and they could, they could use better, better food, you know? And so, um, we've, we've taken them to the next level with the, with the intention of changing their paths dramatically. Uh, we don't want them to learn to read and write and add and subtract and whatnot. No, that's not enough. You know, they, they need the best schooling we can afford so that each one of them can grow to be a completely different person to what they've been kind of predestined to be, you know? I don't want them to learn to be a plumber so they can earn a living. Well, maybe in Germany that's a very good job. But uh, here it's hard, hardly paid, you know? Yeah. Or a carpenter, which in Sweden is handsomely rewarded. But here it's not. And so I want them to be whoever they want to be. But to have the preparation, you know, the, the schooling, to be able to make that choice. I have some who want to be painters, but others want to be congressmen. And... For as long as I can, I will support them and try to find the means to, to help them out. I do, I do reach out to friends and to anyone who can help, who has a good heart or can understand the project. The project really is, if you change one children's path, may he be a boy or a girl, you will change and impact their families directly. Mm -hmm. And if you can change a family's future in a village where nobody has anything and hasn't seen anything outside that little village to help them realize there's more around the world, there's more out there to accomplish and to achieve and to attain in the right path, well, then you will have changed, hopefully, with 12 children, a good portion of the village, better income better homes, better understanding how important the education is for every sense, you know? And, and I must add that these kids are such beautiful souls because Mayan people here are people who are very attached to the land and to the goodness of humankind. And they, they exploit it daily. They, they're they're uh, very natural in, in, in those senses, you know? Um, and when you add knowledge to that, uh, he, these little stars start shining in such a beautiful way. Their perception of things and their first reactions or instinct, their first instinct, uh, in instinctive reaction is such a beautiful thing. The minute they have a little extra than the, the rest, they share it with those around them that have less. So... I love that idea to provide chances. We've spoken about that. That's, yes. I think, also the social responsibility you mentioned. It's very important. Yes. Therefore, one has to be aware of yes. how good one owns life already is. Yes. And be then able also to share that. So inspiration can, of course, come from materialism. Like you provide them also the schooling opportunity. This is an opportunity that it comes to money. And, of course, inspiration can be which you provide in addition the mental inspiration. I would like to go down to your encounter with Chet. We've spoken about him and I could see how also you could, it was maybe one encounter in your life where you could expand. Yeah, so when you said before, you are ongoing learning. Yes. To what extent was this encounter with someone who had maybe a different view on life and different kind of value scheme that you've known before. To what extent was he helping you to find parts within you that you have not seen before? Oh, absolutely. No, he, he helped me open doors within me that I... I, I well, I'm glad they exist, but, mm. but uh, we, we did clash many times because his perspective... He's a social anthropologist, uh, he's British born in South Africa, and he has seen a different reality of the world than I have. And uh, the struggle was very funny, now that I look back on it, but very inspiring. And, and to see someone who came from such, such a part of the world, you know, where, where I've been fortunate to live also, you know, in England, uh, 
to take himself out of that comfort zone, uh, to come to live on the banks of a, of a river where it's extremely hot and to eat rice and beans three times a day because this is the only thing they can afford to feed them uh, and, be, and be at peace with it. At first he told me it was very difficult, but then he realized there were more important aspects of what he was doing and the food was secondary. And he started being grateful for whatever food he got, you know. And all of these things uh, really uh, brought different, very different, very strong uh, perspective into me. And, and I guess he inspired me by example. If someone with such a comfortable life in England uh, can come and do that, for people in my in our country, pardon the the way to to uh, express it, but in Spanish you say mi país, mm -hmm. my country, mm -hmm. but in English it sounds a little funny because it sounds like you're being pretentious, <laughs> you know. But it's not. It's just our country. I'll say it like that. It's easier. But they are our responsibility, or our, our, you know, our people, and foreigners come and, and give them love and help and nourishment. What the heck are we doing sitting on the sidelines watching? Get up. Get out of that chair. Do something for your own kind. You know? Mm -hmm. If you help your country, you're only helping yourself as well. And it sounds selfish. But if you empower the people in your country, the one who's going to benefit from it is not just them. You will too. You will too. So, chat enabled you to see the world, to summarize... My own world. Your own world, yeah, your home country, but also from a different perspective, which is giving you a new dimension. How did you and your body react on this? Well, equality, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of equality mm -hmm. and, and all of its consequences, mm -hmm. which I embrace. Um, and um, how did I react to it? It was hard in the beginning. It was hard to understand his point of view. So how did you react? Did you start a fight? Did you start a normal conversation, oh, no, an argument? Never, never did you need time for yourself to digest? And then you came back and said, oh, your point was yes. reasonable. Yes. Well, fortunately, we, we've had many arguments, but not uh, aggressive ones. Mm -hmm. Just, just we, we sit and he exposes his point of view and how he sees the reality of things. And then I, I assimilate whatever he's telling me and adapted to my reality because there are facts of each country and each culture that are different. But it was a process, of course, It right? is a process. It is a wonderful process through which if you have the ability to uh, take the information and process it, uh, assimilate it, and then have a second sit down, you know, um, I guess it required a, a humility on both, mm -hmm. on both sides. Uh, and... Um, And patience on Chad's behalf <laughs> because I was not so flexible in the beginning and I was like ah this is baloney you know how many foreigners we have coming into Guatemala to tell us how things need to be done in Guatemala and why don't they go back to their own countries and you know worry about their people uh, and, and we had all of these conversations can you maybe because it was so beautiful when you um, told me about when he said, can some of the kids stay with us here? Ah, yes. This, I thought, was, it's so like, you can really see, you can the really difference. see it in front of your eyes. Yes, yeah. yes. So, yes, uh, uh, he asked me, the first time he asked me if he could bring some of the children to the house, uh, naturally with the parents' permission, and, a, um, and, and someone, a, a chaperone from one of the families to come with, you know, an, an older brother or, or a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was very concerned because I, 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 my first reaction was, goodness, Chad, yes, they're always welcome here, but if they're going to spend the weekend, I don't have this many beds. There were eight kids or something? Yeah, it was six kids, six in, the, kids. In, in the beginning. And I thought, I don't have six bedrooms to spare. <laughs> And I, uh, I clearly understand you. I could put two or three children in a bedroom with three different beds. But I didn't have those extra beds. And so I was very concerned. And he looked at me almost laughing, you know, and he goes, oh, Charlie, by all means, what are you, nuts? <laughs> you need to see how these people live. They can sleep here on this beautiful carpet that you have in the living room. I have a very thick carpet, by the way. And we can put like a, a, a nice a quilt and some pillows and they're children. They're going to be happy. It's like a slumber party. 
and I almost fell off the chair. I said, that's absolutely <laughs> not how it's going to be. I'm not going to be sleeping in my house, in a bed, in my private room, in the comf with all of my comforts, and my guests are going to be sleeping on the floor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely never. And so Chad, well, you know, he kind of came to terms, and he also knows me well by now, and he knows that there are things you can negotiate and some that you can believe you've negotiated, and when you come home, you're going to find that Charlie went and found several <laughs> several mattresses from my father's house uh, from the guest uh, rooms and uh, I aligned them all in the living room and put sheets and pillows on them and a little lamp and their bottles with water and whatever you would do for a guest when they come you know nothing fancy but comfort comfort and if I'm entitled to that comfort uh, well so should the rest at least in my humble abode you know uh, the rest of the world I cannot manage but Whatever's in front of my nose and I can do, I like to do it, you know. And they were, they were, they were quite impressed and, and enjoyed the weekend. We went bowling and one of the fathers who came had never even seen a bowling ball or a bowling alley. And mind you, he was the best bowler of all of us. And uh, he struck, you know, he just, it was like all the points in each throw. And uh, we had a little pizza, you know, the type of things that you would do with your cousins or your children or your family on a weekend. But still, it's very particular because what happened at the end is the mixture of different social levels or classes. Yes. And despite it's, I think, not political correct to talk about classes, I think in reality it's still there all over the world, one right. can say. If you look bad, back, I think you met Chad like... Four years ago, yes. if you would have a look at yourself five years ago, all in all, how has your personality changed? What has life taught you in those last couple of years? Where could you feel this was really an expansion of my mind or even of my heart? I get closer to who I really am. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. My personality is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But my mind and my perspective of things mm. has changed dramatically. Um, I have learned that my concept of someone being poor was quite a lot more generous than uh, I had never seen poverty at that level. And I live in a country that is full of very poor people. And I understand poverty quite well. But this gave me a first-hand knowledge um, and I saw it with my own eyes and lived it in my own body for, for a week. And I have to say that um, this experience of having met Chad completely changed my view and my views and has helped me also better understand some of the social situations that we face currently in our country. And it makes you, it makes you more sensible, more um, permeable and more open. Mm -hmm to understanding these differences which are everywhere in the world we we have social injustice and without sounding like one of these activists that are always confronting uh, we do have too much social injustice and in, and and on disparity in this world and uh, i don't think we would lose much by we're, we're, nobody's taking anything from us by sharing with those who have less, you know? And, and, and what, what little we give is really a lot, like I said in the beginning, to others. So yes, it changed me completely. He changed me completely. He's a friend I cherish very much, a good, a good man and a soul that has taught me a lot. And, and he's younger than I am. <laughs> How many years younger? Eight, 18, 18, right? If I count 18. Yes, I was about to say. 18 years younger, but I think he's a very old soul. And uh, he's he's full of he's full of perspectives that have uh, fed my my soul. I had the impression when you spoke about him, and I could feel this uh, affection for him, that he also ha maybe unconsciously had some kind of mentorship also for you, in mean, a positive yes, point yes, of view. Absolutely. Who else were mentors in your life where you said, well, this is a person, again, opening up my own mind, my own spirit, bringing yes. me out of my comfort zone. I'm learning something. I'm expanding. Who else have you had as your mentor in your life? Well, I think my parents have been very big, um, 
very big influences. And beyond my parents, my grandparents. My grandparents, I come from a family of, of characters. You know, my grandmother uh, was someone who was probably my best friend. May she rest in peace. And Why she, was she so special? I, she was the source of so many ways of happiness and love. Like most, like most grandmas, you know. They, uh, they bring happiness to you as a child. Mm -hmm. But they give structure. But they have the privilege of being able to pamper you without consequences, yeah, you know. Like and then, that. and then your parents have to, <laughs> yes. And then, then the parents have to do the the, the discipline bit, you know, and the and the and the structure. Your family was a very traditional family, right? Yes, on my dad's side of the family, we uh, we are a very traditional Spanish-style family, Catholics, uh, practicing Catholics, um, hard workers. Um, who was getting back to the mentor question because it is your family business have you ever worked for someone else yes yes um, in my family you don't get to work for the company just because you're born into the family <laughs> um, I actually had uh, three one two three jobs before I was finally eligible to apply for the family um, my mother said uh, you will never be a good boss if you haven't been an employee um And I quite enjoyed, to be honest, to be an employee a bit more than a boss. Ah. Yes, yes, because th there's limitations. When you're, a, when you're an employee, you, you do your job well and you get paid. And that's the end of it. I mean, there are trials and tribulations and, and you know, the social interactions within a company are always complex and diverse. But when you're the boss, you're responsible for not only the employees you employ, but their families, their families' well-being. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is a lot of responsibility. You know, that's why uh, now that I'm, I'm part of, of, in the board of directors of, of this relation, um, work to family relation, it is very important to observe everything that's happening within the families that, that work for you. What are their children doing? Um, how many weeks does the mother really get after giving birth? Um, and once, however many weeks it is, you know, if it's in Sweden or if it's here, uh, who's going to take care of these children, you know? Uh, so there we found, for instance, the importance of uh, creating a crèche, uh, a, 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 like um, a place where we take care of the, mm -hmm. of the babies at, at the office. Mm. Yes, we hired It's nurses. very modern, huh? Yes, we <laughs> hired nurses and nannies mm. uh, so that... The mothers, for instance, who are still breastfeeding, mm. because this will happen, and we are not Sweden, sadly. So, mm. we don't. They, by law, they do not get that many weeks. We do give them an extra month, but eventually they're going to come back to work, which is admirable of every mother who works and is a mother. You know, that is already a superpower. Um, and so we we must see how we, as a family or a company, can help them be at peace. And one of the things. For instance, my mom said is, I would never be at peace if, even if I had the best help at home, if I am in the office and my child is at home. So why don't Was we... your mom working as well? No, my mother, when I was younger, my, but all, everyone worked. Everyone worked by choice. Well, my dad and I don't think it was by choice, but, but he did what he loved. You know, he studied, he went to school in California, and then, uh, and then he came and started. He was also an employee for very important companies. And then he started his own business. And my mom is a radiologist. Oh, wow. Yeah. Who else helped you to be the, become the person that you are right now? Mentorship. It was your grandmother that had a key influence on you, the rest of your family members. My Did dad. you find your, your dad as well? My dad is a great example. Could you find father. someone out of the family bound as well, where you would say, this person had a really huge impact on me? There have been many people who have impacted me. Um... I have a particular teacher mm -hmm. who's still in our realm of, uh, of friends. Mm -hmm. um, here in Guatemala, at least the school I attended, mm -hmm. you started kindergarten and, mm -hmm. and you're together until the day you graduate from high school. And along that path, there are many teachers and I can probably name all of them, mm -hmm. if not most, well, most of them, if not all. And uh, one of them was, was uh, my teacher, Brenda, uh, Brenda Michan. She, uh, a wonderful Jewish lady, 
who um, came into our lives in sixth grade. When you when you're kind of starting puberty, and and the world falls apart, and you drown in a glass of water for things, you know. And she was such an inspiration and an example. She, she's a she's a psychologist, but she was our math teacher. And I, for some reason, once purity hit me, I, I declared war onto anything that had numbers, and I felt stupid at it. But it was just because I don't know why I didn't <laughs> want to pay attention and learn. In the other social uh, arenas, I was excellent, but in math, I was terrible. And. The math teachers previous to Brenda used to be very harsh. And I was about to fail every time. And oh, yeah, I had to have a special help. And my parents were always biting their nails to see if I was going to make it <laughs> until Brenda came. And I, I say this for myself and many other students uh, that attended our school. Uh, Brenda was a source of love, patience. And she would not be satisfied with you saying, I don't understand. Uh, she would sit with you until she helped you understand it in a loving way. And up until today, I, I have many uh, friends that uh, have the same feeling I do. And I think she was a great inspiration in regards to patience and love and true meaning of education. Because many of us face teachers like a mountain that you have to cross and it's going to be difficult. And you have, no, they must be enablers. They must enlighten you, not frighten you. And Brenda was one of those. And up until today, we have her on our school chat. And uh, mind you, I can even show you, every morning, she still greets us. Before anyone wakes up, she sends a message wishing us a wonderful day. Really? Yes. Yes, it's, it's, uh, she's an amazing And now Charlie woman. is on his iPhone going through a certain chat and finding oh how sweet is this every day for instance today Can she you sent read what she said? it says paso a desearte un lindo día lleno de cosas positivas oh, so it basically says i'm just stopping by to wish you a beautiful day full of positive events it's beautiful uh, you know when when you get this every day uh, somebody cares for you mm. still up until I'm a 49 year old man you know and this woman still stops daily to wish us a good day it's lovely and I can see cards day. with beautiful flowers yeah. I hope, I hope your day is beautiful. beautiful little videos An abrazo de buen dia. yeah she's she's always um, it's very sweet. she's always there you know and she as a Jewish woman she taught us uh, in our class we had a very diverse classroom and we're all still together and love each other very much we had we had um, class members that belonged to the Church of England we had Muslims we had Jews we had Catholics and we had Protestants also Christians and mind you we're still all dear friends and uh, Brenda would teach us about Judaism uh, on Fridays for instance Shabbat And then Hussein, one of our classmates, who's a dear friend of mine, who's Lebanese and a Muslim, uh, would tell us what they would do, you know, and when they had their periods and, 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 and observe, you know, observe different uh, celebrations. And, and Brenda brought us together into embracing this, this uh, variety, mm -hmm. you know, and she taught us to embrace difference and to learn from each other before you tried to judge. And, and she was very clever in the ways she did it, you know. Uh, she wasn't always like the soft, loving mm -hmm. one. No, no, she speaks loud. She said, hey, watch it, watch your mouth. What do you think you're doing? Why don't you tell him? What? You know, she was, yeah. she, 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 she's, she's been an inspiration to be a better, better human. Charlie, we have something in common. We do have certain cultural background in common. And yeah. we found out that two days ago, we both had, we were laughing at the car. I think yeah. no one else understood what it was about. Can you tell us a bit about that cultural part that you also inherited and I think also live? Yes. Well, I, I suppose you're speaking about the Prussian background. And uh, it, it was funny how we discovered it yeah. because I was describing how my mother, in spite of the fact that we were blessed by growing with help at home, 
Um, my mother would make us on the weekends, my brothers and I. Um, we had to make our own breakfast and make, make our room, you know, make our bed, bathe, get dressed, put the dirty, well, the dirty clothes in the hamper. That's no effort, of course. There's no <laughs> science to that. But she, she made sure that we appreciated the work that had been done for us throughout the week. Or for, One has to say it's different than in Germany. You have service yes. supported yes. here also yes. for your daily life, right? Something that oh, yes. we are not usually having. Yes, yes. I was fortunate to grow with mm -hmm. uh, live-in service, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maids, cooks, mm -hmm. drivers, gardeners, a house mechanic, <laughs> things like this. It sounds very strange. You know, uh, and it is, it is not normal. It is mm -hmm. not normal. But we are one big fam happy family, mm -hmm. you know, and mom made sure that they were always happy and treated well. And the same way as in the company, she, she made sure that uh, we all knew that if they had children, that their children were well, uh, if they were ill or whatnot, mm -hmm. because they live at, the maids live at home with you, you know, mm -hmm. so... Um, It, it was it was it, it was a very nice way to teach us the differences and the privilege that we had. And um, she did it by there was the Saturday and Sunday example, right? Yes, yes, yes. And you know, you're very clear in Germany, Saturday is a day that you do your laundry most times, you know, and then or you do your shopping and your laundry and stuff. And on Sunday, it's well, it's Sunday, you rest, you know. And, but there's many things you have to take care of. And mom, uh, mom wanted to give the service a break also. And so we did it everything, and uh, it was also very nice at Christmas time. Uh, she would set the table on Christmas morning, uh, but on the twenty fourth, not not the twenty fifth, and um, we would have breakfast with them. Mm. But she would take care of the employees, you know, and uh, and she would set up the, the good stuff, you know, nice. There's a crystal. very nice thing of giving back at the end of the year. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, uh, you know, gratitude is something that must be taught and learned and experienced. And I think my parents have instilled that in us as together with hard work and consideration for others. Um, I'm not saying they're saints. Uh, they each have their, their strengths and their weaknesses. I do come, if we, re, if we go back to the Prussian background, I do have, my mother has a tremendous temper, you know, very... You, you don't negotiate. There's no negotiating table with a, with a Germanic mother, you know. And her other side is Swedish. It sounds so. a bit familiar. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, there's no negotiating at anything, you yeah. know. And uh, and so, uh, it, it wasn't so bad. What else could you feel like was coming from the Prussian background? We uh, spoke about. I think, for me, it's also this loyalty thing. This yes. is some. Yes. You can really hurt me by not being loyal. It's one of the key loyalty, values I have. Loyalty is one of the core values, I think, um, that that you can hurt me mm -hmm. if you fail. Um, telling me the truth is better by far, no matter how bad the truth could be, than by being disloyal. Yeah. Um, loyalty is something that is hard to find, and once found, you don't want it to let you down, you know? But uh, But yes... Loyalty is one of the core values I, I do uh, get from my from both backgrounds. To be honest, uh, discipline, mm -hmm. discipline is uh, militant, militant. You know. But you bring things forward, right? And you bring them. No, things happen. Things happen. Yeah, yeah. We don't talk about things. We we discuss them. We make a plan, and we get to it. <laughs> Get going. Come on. Let's get it done. Let's not just yeah. talk about Let, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. You get your ass up and you just do it. Yes, yes, yes. And you, you should know how to do it. Mm. You know? Don't get an idea and put someone else to do it. Yeah. Hey, like you said, get off your ass and get it done. Yeah. This is this thing when you start something, you bring it to an end. It's, for me, sometimes... That involves discipline. Yes. How is your environment reacting to that? Because it's a very particular character as well. And it might be viewed as dominant, as running over, as overruling, as yeah. taking too much space, as being too much result orientated. I don't know what. So how is, how is your experience with that? Well, I think it's all in the motivation, no? Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, you might be result oriented, but uh, like, I, like I said before, it's, 
It's the hand you use to attain results. Mm. You don't need a harsh hand. You need diligence. You need perseverance and constants. You know, you need you need discipline. But that doesn't mean it has to be harsh or foul-mouthed or rude. It, you can do both, you know. It just a little intolerance is always good. You know, because these excuses, uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. Let's let's call it by its name and let's get it fixed if it didn't come out the right way. The world is not over, but we need to keep working, you know. And so I think it's all in the delivery. Speaking of both, the first time we met, I experienced you as a very smart counterpart we had dinner and we were talking some business mm -hmm. you remember business yes, m&a yeah. content and i could see how fast your mind is yeah. um and i could also see another side it was a humorous side i had a laugh <laughs> incredible yeah. to what extent is humor important for you for me it's basic it's uh i i need it I absolutely need it. Uh, of course, there are times when humor doesn't have a, a place. It's out of place. But I think life is so much better if you can giggle about stuff. Even the bad stuff, you can find something positive. And it's so much better if you can laugh about it. You laugh at yourself even, you know, as often as you can or like. Mm. Uh, then, then beat yourself down. Mm. Yeah. And what I think as well is very important to give this mind working thing a break just to be silly sometimes oh, yes. and to make the mind that it sometimes yes. is very strong just to knock it out right i'll tell you something i think a lot of very good ideas have come from my silliness <laughs> yes. Yes. yes 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 because you just I really totally yes that. you totally relax your mind and you laugh about things and then you see yeah, the world in a different idea. perspective yes. You say, well, what the heck? Let's try this. Why not? And then people find it good. And okay, so we go with it. You know? Yeah, why not? Three last questions. Maybe you give a quick answer. Yeah. What is the biggest lesson you've learned from your relationship with your parents? Unconditional love. Mm. Yes. The value of unconditional love. Absolutely clear statement what would an amusement park filled with your biggest fears be like oh goodness it's That's most a fancy question right yes, it's a fancy question but it's most amusement parks because i'm not fond of heights mm. or, or speed that is uh, directly going to hurt me so roller coasters are a thrill for me but I've, i used to be very scared um A lonely room might be a, a fear that I have. I, I don't like... Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy myself a lot. I like my alone time. To the point that I, some people think I'm a little bit of a hermit. But I always know there's someone there if I need to pick up. So not to, to not have anyone around to have that love. That would be scary. Uh, what else is scary to me? Um, ah, a room full of snakes. <laughs> <laughs> that is horrible. I have a very funny anecdote with that, but I'm going to answer just... No, no, this would be the last one. Do you have a joke to share? Maybe this fits in that question. This would uh, be the last question. Uh, well, it's not a joke, but it's an anecdote of my <laughs> life. We were in India, in uh, the Gujarat region, mm -hmm. uh, sitting down in a beautiful stately home that belongs to a family that owns um, a business similar to ours and whom we were going to start doing business with. And they, um, they set the beautiful table on the lawn, on the green lawn in front of their home. It's similar to this. And uh, beautiful, very English looking, you know, the long white linen, you know, uh, tablecloth and very nice silver and everything was impeccable. And here I'm trying to be at my best behavior because I'm representing my father <laughs> and the family with my cousin Jose. And we're both sitting there, you know, doing the polite chat and uh, getting to acquainted with the owners and stuff and very cultured very esteemed high esteemed people <laughs> and then uh, the man decides uh, uh, there, were, there were three enormous baskets in front of our table over on the lawn and um, 
the man decides that he's going to um, delight us with his private uh, collection or something. I don't know what you call it. And mind you, I was so curious, what's in those baskets? And then I thought, well, maybe they've got, I don't know, maybe blankets for us in case it gets cold or something. Well, no, they were full, full, they had cobras inside. And this man like has all these cobras, uh, king cobras, gorgeous ones from afar, <laughs> from afar. And so the minute they open these baskets, you know, mm -hmm. And they whoop out this enormous <laughs> cobra out. I, I felt this shiver through the, the back of my spine. You know, like, and I look at Jose and Jose is looking at me with his face like, oh my goodness. And then they open the second one and then the third one. And there's more snakes. <laughs> and then one of the snake who gets off the hook of, of this uh, stick falls on the grass and starts rushing. Have you ever seen how fast a snake <laughs> goes? Really fast, I know. Oh my God. I screamed like a girl, <laughs> stood up from the table. The tablecloth got stuck on my belt buckle. <laughs> I pulled off the tablecloth. <laughs> the whole table went to hell. And I ran like a maniac up to the house and locked myself in and my cousin Jose was running behind me and was banging on the door please let me in please let me in and I wouldn't open the door <laughs> because I was so scared and I, we just put egg all over our face that day and they they were so embarrassed you know they said I, I had no idea you were afraid of snakes and I said who the hell likes snakes <laughs> you know I mean there are people I know there are people who like snakes and snakes are, are beautiful beings but I, I struggle with snakes a little bit still, particularly the big ones, you know. So and when you see it on the loose, running on the grass, what are you doing there? You forget your proper behavior. Run for your life. But there was no risk, apparently. But I just, I, I, I declined the opportunity to sit at that table again. <laughs> After they set it back up, I thanked them very much. And I said, we can, we can have a cup of tea here in the living room. I would appreciate it. So, yeah. It's not really a joke, but it's a funny anecdote of the many idiotic things I've done I like that. during my business life. What's, do you have a joke at hand? I don't. I don't. I don't think I do. Um, I'm not good at telling jokes. You're so humorous. Like, again, when I saw you before, that I think personality, like, you don't need jokes. I think I would need them. Because <laughs> what I would love to have more is, like, humor. I yeah. love this quality to make, like... As you did, like well, a whole I, I table to entertain. Oh, you have an improper one. No, I only have improper ones that I repeat from my grandmother at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my grandparents on Tuesdays um, sat us down with my, my brother Fernando and I. We would come to lunch on Tuesdays. And every Tuesday, my grandfather would teach us a new word. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they were synonymous, you know. And, but we would learn to, to broaden our vocabulary in English. Uh, and and so um, he didn't want us to sound very basic. He wanted us. To, he wanted to polish us in every possible way he could. And so <laughs> um, they were always teaching us words. And and one day I I heard the word lesbian at at school, but I had no idea what a lesbian was. And so um, I came to my grandmother and I said, Grandma, what's a lesbian? Mm -hmm. And grandmother had no quarrels with life. What's natural is natural. You know, she didn't cover or sugarcoat it or anything. So she explained to me that a lesbian was a woman who, who, loved, who likes women. And without making any particular fuss about it. And I understood it clearly and there was no problem. Uh, but then uh, she made a joke about it. Once we were walking down in the fish market in Stockholm. And she stopped. She was a very humorous woman. And she stopped and she looked at me and she said, Charlie. Do you know what's the definition of confusion? And I thought, is this a trick from Tuesdays? <laughs> and I said, oh, confusion, let me think, Grandma. Well, uh, confusion, do you need a synonymous? Like, what do you need a definition? And she goes, don't trouble yourself so much. I'll tell you the definition of confusion. Immediately, I felt like a loser. Because I was like, oh, no, she's going to tell me. And I wasn't able to give a, a, you know, a proper answer. And she says... A group of blind lesbians in a fish market. <laughs> oh my God, I wanted to die. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> so this is not exactly the type of joke a grandmother tells. Yeah. 
But that's the relationship we had. That that might explain a little bit of how we enjoyed our grandparents, you know. And I enjoyed that hour with you. Goodness, it's been an hour already. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> John, Charlie. See? Well, I'm still with your grandmother right now. <laughs> <laughs> This was not a joke. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been all my pleasure. It's lovely having met you, Thank you and uh, I look forward to uh, doing more crazy stuff together. <laughs> I'm on for it. <laughs> Hit the subscribe button and let us know how you enjoy the episode. See you soon and keep your wings to fly high. Yes. And now I'm looking up in the sky again. Thank Sun God is the wasps have gone. I don't know if that was entertaining, we'll see what the people